time reading about them, looking at them, drawing them, collecting them, and just generally daydreaming about them. It got to the point where it was almost kind of like prayer for me. I loved wishing that they could be real. I loved hoping that somehow, by my hoping, they would become real. I believe that this world would become more beautiful and magical if I hoped hard enough. My name is Morgan Berman, and I have been hoping my startup into existence for the last two years. And I hope that by the end of this, you will join me as Unicorn Believers. What I'm going to do is share with you a little bit about my journey, starting at the tender age of five all the way up to the present day as a tech entrepreneur and CEO. And I hope it will help inspire you to take the plunge that I took to follow my dreams and to go after what seems like an impossible fantasy for Unicorn. So let's go back in time for a moment. This is me. <laughs> That's the boy I'm madly in love with. <laughs> it's 1990 and I'm five years old. And in case you can't tell, I am very hopeful that Jonathan <laughs> will love me too. And in case you can't see, both of my hands are crossed. And Max and Tim don't look very happy about this. <laughs> very optimistic person. I've also never been very good at hiding how I feel about things. In case you need further proof, <laughs> this was not a one-time incident of me thinking that my wishes and hoping could change reality. This is an even earlier example. I'm about four in this, and the man of the hour is Louis. <laughs> this is me, and this is the boy I wanted to marry. <laughs> wedding gown, he would have to marry me. I hadn't quite had cause and effect crystallized in my mind yet. So we began to identify this pattern in my behavior of wishing and hoping. And before we go any further, I have to stop for a moment and acknowledge that I am very lucky and am the way I am because I have two wonderful parents who taught me how to wish and to hope. I grew up watching my mother build her publishing company from scratch into something amazing that she built out of nothing. And I got to watch my dad treating people struggling with mental illness while under-resourced, trying to convince others of the value of his work and dependent on donors to help make a difference. So skipping ahead a little bit here, I am graduating from college. And a narrative that many of us learned as a child was, if you are smart and kind and hardworking, you will find a fulfilling job make a place for yourself in the world, and work and life will come together in a beautiful, happy mess. <laughs> and then I graduated in 2008. This narrative of hope came crashing down around me when I graduated with a degree in women's studies and anthropology from one of the best schools in the country, but with no real practical skills. Now that's not entirely true, because I did learn how to organize groups of my peers to produce feminist activist plays and raise money for domestic violence shelters and have other worthy good causes. In college, I also learned that I wanted to help make the world a better place by working with people that cared about the same things that I did and have fun doing it. And as amazing as this was, when I graduated, I didn't see any Craigslist ads for feminist activist directors at a starting salary of approximately $50,000. <laughs> if you see one of those, let me know. So today, I want to focus on this concept of hope and how I really had to stop looking outwardly and find my own internal compass and my own emotional stockpile of hope and tap into it and do with it what I could. Of course, this can be terrifying, and it took me 10 years to find the courage to do it. I hope I can help save you some of that time and just jump in. Now, this is a very scientific chart that I've created for you today uh, that I made outlining what I've come to call the overall life octane level. That's low, uh, or one sense of enjoyment and fulfillment. And as you can see, after college, things went a bit downhill. <laughs> I don't think I'm the only one in the audience whose low graph looks like this. What I realized is that my fear of failure was holding me back from happiness. Somewhere in my mid-twenties, I started realizing if I didn't try now, I was going to be miserable my whole life, and that just wasn't an option. The fear of never even trying scared me more than the fear of failing. This past decade has been a bit like playing Goldilocks, searching for that perfect bowl of porridge. Spoiler alert, it doesn't exist. When's the last time you saw porridge on a menu? <laughs> So my first job after college, oops, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so my first job after college was at a nonprofit that shared my values but suffered from a 
mentality of scarcity. Jobs were being cut and health centers shut down due to theft on the executive level and a lack of self-sustaining revenue streams. I saw firsthand how inherently unsustainable nonprofits can be, and this stuck with me later when advisor after advisor told me, why don't you just make Milk Crate a nonprofit? No. <laughs> they saw it as an easy way to solve what can be called the revenue problem, but I refused. As I've learned from one of my mentors, Judy Wicks, if you are creating something of value, then value should be shared with you in return, and money is just an exchange of value. On the cockroach. <laughs> Up next was another horribly mismanaged nonprofit with equally good intentions, but more cockroaches and expired baby, baby formula than I could count. The new lesson from this might seem obvious, but once you have this, that one monstrous boss, it really helps imprint in you the goal of being the best boss you can be if you are ever lucky enough to be one. Third up, as a result from a quick end at my previous job, was working at a chic cafe in Center City. My main takeaway from the service industry is that everyone should be required to wait tables at some point in their lives. <laughs> also, on a side note, everyone who can should have to ride a bicycle in traffic to know what that feels like, but that's a different talk. <laughs> I say this because when you serve people their breakfast at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning before they've had their first cup of coffee, you are often regarded with the same care and concern as people show for their throwaway cups, which is none. <laughs> then came Ken. No, not that pen, this pen. <laughs> Finally, I was making progress, getting back to doing something that challenged my mind, but I was isolated without coworkers, without purpose, and little room for creative expression. So I found a part-time job at Apple. No, not that Apple, this Apple. Apple was a major turning point for me. It was a reminder that working in peer groups with like-minded people builds camaraderie and teamwork. It also connected me to technology in a stronger way, which was very empowering and obviously has since helped me with building Milk Crate. But there was still this insurmountable hierarchy with me at the bottom as a part-time specialist down here and Steve Jobs and all the other cool kids up here. And that just didn't sit well with me. I wanted to feel in charge. I wanted to make things and to solve problems beyond helping people reset their passwords. <laughs> also, this is the rest of that picture. It was another unrequited love situation. <laughs> My first 
first startup was a fashion company when I was 17. It was based on reusing vintage materials and designs, and I sold them to Anthropology and Joan Shep. But I just stopped doing it because I didn't have the passion and I didn't know what lay ahead. And after 10 years, I can see that I actually had it all figured out back when I was 17. I just didn't have the life experience to realize it at the time. That initial spark was always with me. It was there all along. But it took 10 years of shitty jobs and lessons learned before I had the confidence and hope to chase unicorns again. And Jonathan, in case you're watching this, mm -hmm. that's my number. <laughs>